When asked to mention members of the Beatles band, the first names that pop up are the Fab Four. The main members of the Beatles that we all know are Paul McCartney, John Lennon, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr. Unknown to lots of fans, there was a particular member of the Beatles that got away at the initial stage. Who do you feel was the Beatle that got away? Let's revisit the role the runaway Beatle played in the success of the band. We'll dive right into this detail, but before we do so, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more exclusive content on the Beatles. How the Beatles got together, grew in fame, and became the best-selling band of all time is a beautiful musical story. Apart from the Fab Four, the popular names you would hear at the inception of the band includes Pete Best and Stuart Sutcliffe. They both had their different reasons for leaving the crew, even though they contributed to the growth in their little way. According to claims, Stewart was the Beatle without any real musical skill that got away. His full name is Stuart Ferguson Victor Sutcliffe, and he is often referred to as the Fifth Beatle. He was a short-lived member of the Beatles and a painter who worked in a style related to abstract expressionism. Stewart was born in Edinburgh, Scotland. He and John Lennon are credited with inventing the name Beatles, as they both liked Buddy Holly's band, The Crickets. Even though he was a member of the Beatles, he was never a skilled musician, having joined the group because of his friendship with John Lennon. Lennon convinced him to buy a bass guitar with the money he had made from the sale of one of his paintings. He was very uncomfortable on stage and usually played with his back to the audience. As an artist, Sutcliffe displayed considerable talent from an early age. His few surviving works show the influence of the British and European abstract artists contemporary with the abstract expressionist movement in the United States. His more figurative work is reminiscent of the kitchen sink school, particularly John Bratby. His later gestural abstractions bear a comparison with John Hoyland and Nicholas de Stael, though they are more lyrical. Stewart did not get to play on the Beatles recording sessions as Tony Sheridan's backup unit in June 1961, although he attended as an observer. There was this talk about him never improving on his skill to become better. A primitive rehearsal tape from probably around 1960 that has been bootlegged was discovered. The recording is is so technically low fi that it's even difficult to hear the bass, let alone determine the veracity of the player. A few songs from the tape were officially issued on the Beatles' first anthology. The consensus seems to be that he never became good, or even attained a basic professional standard on the instrument. He seldomly sang on stage, so it was a bit difficult to rate his skills. According to the thorough listing of songs the Beatles performed live in Mark Lewison's The Complete Beatles Chronicle, there are just two tunes, the Elvis Presley ballads, Love Me Tender and Loving You, that Sutcliffe is known to have sung lead on. It came to light in the Sutcliffe biography, Backbeat, Stuart Sutcliffe, The Lost Beatle, that Stuart did write some songs, though none seem to have been seriously performed, let alone recorded by the Beatles. It has sometimes been written that Sutcliffe and Paul McCartney did not get along, perhaps partially due to McCartney's frustrations with Sutcliffe's musical limitations. There was a time when they did fight on stage once, though it didn't have anything to do with music. However, Stewart was a major influence that helped in their startup, location, setups, and the like. To think that they all started the band as young lads. Four of the five were teenagers, John Lennon, 19, Paul McCartney and Pete Best, 18, George Harrison, 17. The fifth, Stuart Sutcliffe, was 20, barely. They left their abode and traveled far distances just to start up a musical career as a team. They played music for the first time in a small club in Hamburg on the 17th of August, 1960. To get to that stage, they had come to an almost unimaginable distance. From their home in Liverpool, they had driven in a cream and green minibus to the port of Harwich. The bus, teetering under the weight of amplifiers and instruments, had to be lifted onto a ferry by a crane. At first, the stevedores had refused to handle such a precarious load. A photograph captured the moment just as they changed their minds, with the 60s hanging in the balance. On their journey, they took turns sleeping on benches as the ferry churned across the North Sea toward the Hook of Holland. From there, they drove to the West German border, where they told officials that they were students, bringing their guitars for sing-songs with friends. They were young enough to encourage the ruse. During the long ride, their manager had recited The Wind in the Willows to entertain them. Entering a roundabout, they turned in the wrong direction and found a gigantic truck bearing down on them. When the tires of the bus became caught in the streetcar tracks, its passengers avoided colliding with a tram, but only at the last second. Finally, as they pulled into Hamburg, they rammed into a car. 
The minibus they journeyed with found its way onto the Reeperbahn, the main avenue of Hamburg's Sinn district, then turned into Gruß Freiheit, a small street named after the Great Freedom offered by a local count around 1610 when he established a set of economic and religious reforms. The band set up their gear in a tiny club at number 64 that offered a daily international program with lingerie shows. Its marquee included a name, Indra, that came from a Hindu deity, a friend to wary travelers and poets. That seemed appropriate. John Lennon took out a pen and crossed out the word silver from the band's name. They were now going to be known as just the Beatles. Stuart Sutcliffe's presence remains a part of the Beatles even though he was not there till the end. Let's just say the crew was destined to become a quartet. On their first night in Hamburg, the band members posed for a photograph as to prove they had survived the crossing. In light blazers, dark pants, and tan cowboy boots, they had not yet settled into their look and were staring off in different directions. But on the right, the bassist was locked in, radiating an attitude of pure rock and roll. Stuart Sutcliffe's pose might have amused the others. He had been playing bass for only seven months and was distinctly less virtuosic than the other three guitarists. Yet, he was the main pointer when it came to propelling their journey across the North Sea into the place where they made history. He joined early in 1960, and his departure in 1961 forced Paul McCartney to pick up the bass, the instrument that God wanted him to play. No band needs three guitarists. Apart from being the major force to propel their journey, his arrival into the group was exceptional. Lennon, energized by his friendship with a brilliant painter, began to hear his muse. Together, they came up with the perfect band name, and Sutcliffe's charisma kept opening doors. His search for his voice guided theirs, and even after he left, and even after he died in 1962, of a mysterious brain injury, his presence was still always felt. He left the Beatles to pursue his career as an artist before they achieved their success and died not long thereafter from a brain hemorrhage. It has been claimed that this was the result of a beating sustained in Liverpool while still a member of the group, but it was more likely to be a hereditary condition. Paul McCartney, previously one of the three guitar players in the group, replaced Sutcliffe on bass. Sutcliffe's importance to the group name from his artistic rather than musical talent. He was the first to have a Beatles haircut, and his sense of style was helped by his lover, Astrid Kirscher. It was rumored that even after his death, he was still talking to the Beatles. There was a Beatle creation myth story that talked about the involvement of Stuart and how it helped him. The Beatles creation story is deeply entrenched and technological. It is simply inevitable that Lennon will meet McCartney and that their genius will conquer the world. But Pauline's archive suggests that, without Sutcliffe's arrival, they might never have found their way onto the ferry. To elevate his role in the story doesn't detract from his bandmates' achievements. On the contrary, it forces new amazement that they made it out of Liverpool at all. In recent years, Sutcliffe has come out of the shadows, all thanks especially to the British writer Mark Lewison, who has been laboring for decades like a medieval scribe on what is sure the most detailed history of the Beatles ever written. Tune In, the first volume of an expected trilogy, appeared in 2013 and devoted 944 pages to their beginnings through 1962. Among other beautiful things Stuart has done, Lewison has shown how pivotal Sutcliffe was during the Wander Yard of 1960. At the end of 1959, the band was an iffy proposition, changing its name every few months. Like Spinal Tap, they suffered from a chronic shortage of drummers, and they collectively owned a single amp. So dim were the group's prospects that George Harrison joined a band with steadier gigs. There was a time at the initial stage when their rehearsals were in Stewart's room. He got to practice his art and also music. He was not the regular kind of musician that the Beatles had. That's all for today's video, guys. But before we end, what do you think about Stuart Sutcliffe? Do you think he was indeed a part of the Beatles? Do you think he contributed to the Beatles' widespread fame? Do you think it was also right to make him a member of the crew based on his friendship with Lennon? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. And if by now you haven't, ensure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new updates about the Beatles.